I should begin by saying I must have misheard the introduction. I'm, I'm profoundly deaf, so I won't have to listen to your questions. But I think Christine said I was called Barry, no. because I'm not. <laughs> Thank you. That's better. Anyway, I ought to say something about myself. Um, looking at what we've seen already, I'm not an academic on the grounds I'm not employed by an academic institution. And being somewhat pernickety about the use of terms, I think one should say academic institutions and people of an academic frame of mind who are not members of those institutions. That's just to make sure that you can recognize that I have some value, however small it might be. My background, which I ought to tell you something about, is that I spent most of my working life after I stopped trying to be a psychologist, was as a bookseller, specializing in books on the occult, which had fascinated me since I was a small child. And after a while, I started writing about it, and people thought fit to publish it, so you may have seen some of my books. I thought this was on, but I'm not sure if it is. Oh, God. Well, then I'll try and speak up, but I am not very good at speaking up without artificial assistance. But if you shout loud enough, I'll hear you telling me you can't hear me, and I will go back up to speaking like this, like that. Anyway, this is all by the way, and I'm doing this to sort of waste a little time, because I realized after I started preparing this that 30 minutes was not anywhere near enough to feed in all the information there was, so I jettisoned the million words and went down to a short summary. So what you're getting is a rough account of what you might face when you research occult periodicals. What I mean by that, we will see. So I'm going to read this. I don't have the aids of um, PowerPoints or slides because I'm a technophobe and incompetent as well. So you must just listen. If you wish to interrupt, do so. If you think what I've said is ridiculously wrong, you can shout out and say, no, no, and I will ignore you. Let us begin with a quotation from a ghost story. Well, I'm going to tell you the title first. It's Thinking Sideways, Pitfalls in the Periodical Labyrinth and How to Avoid Them. So we start with a quotation from a ghost story, Mr. Humphreys and His Inheritance by M.R. James. Now, the estate that forms that inheritance includes a maze and a fine library, in which Mr. Humphreys finds an odd little book of the 17th century both author and title unknown because it lacks its title page, but he's fascinated by it because it includes a moral tale about the fate of a man on a perilous quest for the precious jewel hidden in the labyrinth. He finally escapes, tells his friends, we expect to find him dead, that, for all I have brought back the jewel, I have brought back that with it that will leave me neither rest at night nor pleasure by day. Substitute for the dual knowledge of the occult and society, and here we are. Our labyrinth is a hundred years of occult periodicals, and the dual is the information that we can tease out of them. Restless we shall be, but not as restless as you will be when you don't get out of my seat when I want to sit down again. <laughs> <coughs> Stay there for the moment. Restless we shall be, but not, I think, displeased with what we find. In this context, the word occult is a many-faceted jewel, including the whole of Western esotericism, and you all know what that means since it was invented about 20 years ago, basically what we used to call the occult. From alchemy, divination, magic and the Kabbalah, to witchcraft, Rosicrucianism and the byways of Freemasonry, plus spiritualism and psychic phenomena, speculative metaphysics, and a kaleidoscope of unorthodox spirituality, both Christian and otherwise. All of these topics have their own literature, including a substantial number of periodicals, which are variously specialist or more general. If you wish to take on the role of Sisyphus and make your task truly unending, you can always add in the occasional, in fact not so occasional, and often valuable contributions to on the, or on the occult to the many popular literary journals of the day. Now, as a fine example, I would point you to James Mew's article, The Black Art, that appeared in the Pall Mall magazine in 1893, and has a splendid illustration by Aubrey Beardsley. If you want to find the details, tap in Beardsley under Google Images, and as soon as you see the fiend as on you, well, you know you've found the article. 
Well, here I'm running ahead of myself. We have to decide just what sort of information we are looking for. How we can apply it to our initial goal of defining and mapping the British occult press and how this can help others who are engaged in trying to make sense of popular occulture. I mean, that's not a phrase I would use, but I mean, it's the popular perception of the occult, how people react to them, what they make of it, and how they engage with it. <coughs> popular occulture is a lot shorter. That is, the public awareness and reception of the ideas, literature, and activities of institutional, and for that matter, private occultism and psychism during the Victorian era and beyond it to the 1940s, which is where I came in, so it's a good ending point. The first step to be taken is to set the parameters of the British occult press. We may take that press to be any and every periodical printed in Britain and published in Britain, and perhaps in Ireland also, which is primarily concerned with one or more topic that falls within the range I've listed above. This, you will say, is all very well. But how do we identify, locate, and gain access to such periodicals? Assuming that you already have a working knowledge of their probable subject matter, you could begin by casting around on internet search engines, which some of you may have done. How many of you are familiar with occult periodicals in general? Please raise your hand if you are. Well, I might as well sit down and give up then, because you already know. Well, if you do try to search for them, you can type in combinations of the right sort of words, such as occult, psychic, magical, mystical, periodical, journal, annual, whatever you want to say. But this is a very hit and miss approach. It would be far more profitable to search first for the various institutions concerned with the occult and the psychic and to examine their library catalogues, if that is such catalogues exist. It doesn't matter whether the books are still there, you get the titles out of it, and that's what you're looking for. And whether they've been digitized and made available online. In the real world of printed books, specialist library catalogues do exist. There's also the invaluable Bucop, which stands for the British Union Catalogue of Periodicals. It's been long out of print, but you'll appreciate in a minute why it's worth looking at. Which can be searched, that is Bucop, for far more quickly for potential keywords than is possible using COPAC, you know, which many of you no doubt do use, because on COPAC, Anything you're searching for online, you have to go one at a time, look for it, weed out the ones that are inappropriate, and then you work through the rest. With Bucop, you can go for the key words like alchemy, astrology, or whatever, and you will find journal, <coughs> monthly, whatever the word is, put after it. And you can identify them, find them, and discover their locations, together with the length of run they hold. Which information is not always there on COPAC or similar <coughs> uh, internet search areas. The only trouble with Bucop is you do need the inserted card. It comes stuck in one or another of the volumes, but it gives the meaning of the abbreviations. Now, they are a curious set of abbreviations. They don't make a lot of sense. So if you haven't got the card, you're really sort of skewered. But nonetheless, if you haven't got it, I'll photocopy mine for you. Here we get to pitfall number one. Now, the catalogues of many libraries, public, academic, specialist alike, are woefully out of date. Not every periodical notionally held by a particular library is still there. The pressing need for shelf space and for money all too often leads to ill-chosen deaccession, which folly is compounded by a failure to update the catalogue or to take adequate measures to ensure easy access if the library or collection has been incorporated within a larger entity. We should not assume that every copy of a periodical listed is still where it was, nor that a specific copy still exists at all. As an aside, I remember once cataloguing a set of the um, Catholic Record Society, and I wanted to find out how many copies there were available, and it listed about 10 including the one I was cataloguing, which had been chucked out by the library that had it. So you cannot trust old catalogues. Well, here are some examples of shortcomings, if not actual loss, in more or less public collections. The Harry Price collection, which 
we are seeing later on, I believe, consisting of works on psychical research, spiritualism, magic, witchcraft, and so on, but not terribly well described by him, is now integrated into the Senate House Library, which has turned his impressive catalogue, it's very well illustrated, and that's a very useful part of it, into an historical document rather than a working tool. It's not always easily accessible either, because I had extreme difficulty getting to see bits of it some years ago, but it may have improved since then. The Library of the Society for Psychical Research is no longer in London, it's now at Cambridge, and is not easily accessible. And if this wasn't being recorded, I would tell you a little side about that. <laughs> um, they seem to have had some difficulty in locating copies of some of the rarer books, but they do insist absolutely that nobody has stolen them. What they mean is it's like an undiscovered murder. They don't know until they find it's happened. Anyway, it's not easy to access the library of the SPR, but there is an original catalogue, which was published in the 1920s with supplements to follow it, and it was put together by Theodore Besterman, who was an excellent bibliographer. So it is very reliable, and on top of which, periodicals are gathered together at the beginning of it, so they're easy to identify. Now, there's also the catalogue of the Library of the London Spiritualist Alliance. Now that is less easy to use, to put it kindly, uh, because there's a curious classification designed by its compiler, uh, Mrs. Farron. She had a very odd way of looking at things. I think she assumed that if you were going to use it, you would have spirit aid to help you find things. <laughs> but nonetheless, it is of use if you can work your way through it. But the periodicals are not separated out, which is something of a problem. There are also a number of major occult periodicals to be found in the Library Museum of Freemasonry down at Freemasons Hall, which isn't too far from here. And the library, the contents of which, or the archival contents, are being fully digitized, and some of the, some of the periodicals too, is open to all visitors and they're happy to let you in. And it has a knowledgeable staff who will guide you to the right thing and they can look things up for you if you can't find them themselves. It isn't easy to use their search facility on their website because they don't seem to use the same kind of keywords we would. If you come at it from a Masonic angle, you'll have a better success, but it won't tell you exactly what they've got. But they do have a lot of very useful periodicals. Yes? Oh, yes. I tell them to be, so they are. Well, I should, yes, I little add, it's open to all visitors, whether Freemasons or not. So you don't have to waste your time engaging in awful rituals and eating bad dinners in order to get in. <laughs> so, it's a one, it is a library I recognise. Some of the things they hold that you might be surprised to see are Lucifer, the Vahan, and the Occult Review, at least part of it. They also have a very inadequate copy of the Rosicrucian and Masonic Record extremely rare, and uh, their possessing it enabled me to get a much superior copy for myself, and that's a long story which I will deal with afterwards, it's not part of this. It's rather funny. Now, the greatest number of occult and psychic periodicals is held by the British Library, but you need to know their specific titles in order to request access to them. You may also be disappointed by a phenomenon that I will list as pitfall number two, that's is, or was true some 20 years ago and subsequently, the problem of the missing leaves. Various people came to me and said, you've got a set of the Occult Review, can we copy it? They said to say, can we borrow it? And I said, no, if you borrow it, I'll kill you. And I was able to photocopy things because they said, we went to the British Library and we got the right volume out and that article was torn out especially Crowley, Florence Farr, anything to do with the Golden Dawn, anything to do with Wilmsers, anything to do with Blavatsky, about half the contents. I don't think they have replaced them, so bear that in mind when you're looking. There is a way out of it, and we'll come to that in due course. Many articles, as I said, were cut out from the Occult Review, and this was done by human rather than demonic practitioners of possession. And this is up to the upset and chagrin of researchers. And nor is the British Library alone. Similar thefts of leaves or entire volumes of periodicals have bedeviled other libraries. To compound this, misfor this misfortune is the sad fact that it was not then, nor is it now, easy to find volumes or individual issues of the Occult Review. 
when they appear online, they are terribly expensive. But not all is lost. Most issues up to 1938 can be accessed in digital form on the website of the APSOC, the International Association for the Preservation of Spiritualist and Occult Periodicals. And they have the text of complete or partial runs of several hundred occult and psychic periodicals in English and other European languages together with American published between the time of the Congress of Vienna, which was 1815, and the start of the Second World War. They're thus available at a few clicks of a button <coughs> if you go online. Well, that is only the start of the process of defining and mapping the British occult press, then of analysing its content and drawing useful conclusions from our careful examination. <coughs> I should add that the periodicals on the app are not at present searchable, which it is means you actually have to read the articles, which is possibly no bad thing. Anyway, the digitizing of the Occult Review has been done on that site in exemplary fashion, from the original part, thus preserving every word of the text, including the advertisement leaves. And those are worth looking at, because when the Occult Review was published, if you wanted to send it back to the publisher and have it bound up, all the advert leaves would be stripped out. But the advert leave, where there wasn't an advert to fill them, would include reviews of quite important books by quite important people. So it is well worth looking for the parts rather than bound volumes. And I've, the third pitfall has also been avoided. This applies to other periodicals as well. That is the absence of wrappers, preliminary and supplementary leaves and loose inserts that are almost never included in bound volumes of periodicals. One of the problems with that is unless someone actually has a run of the parts, we don't know what is missing. And that's something to bear in mind. You cannot assume that when you found the periodical, you found all of it, even if it says it's complete. It may be in terms of publication, not necessarily in terms of what was tipped into it. Um, the point of that is that if you don't have these extras, it can severely research <coughs> diminish the research value of the periodical. And I'll give you an example. I'm thankful that I was spared from such a loss when I was working on the history of the Theosophical Publishing Society. My experience may illustrate the benefit of having all this, this extra stuff. From 1887 onwards, the principal British journal of the Theosophical Society was Lucifer, a Theosophical magazine, retitled in 1897 as the Theosophical Review. It was a consciously literary journal <coughs> in that it consisted of papers largely with occasional correspondence and a few little reports. But with the correspondence columns reflecting the different viewpoints but not taking up a great deal of space. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a debate, for example, over the esoteric section of the society uh, where though that was written about in early volumes the TS didn't like to talk about the esoteric section, and they don't appear once that was in full swing. But that's to do with the history of the TS, not the periodicals. Internecine warfare was frequent in the Theosophical Society, and its progress and the identity of the protagonist can be charted to some degree in the pages of Lucifer. What you can't find out are the activities of the publishing society, their disputes with the original publisher, George Redway, and the various mixed fortunes of theosophical authors in the form of positive reviews or the remaindering of failed titles which were listed on sheets loosely inserted showing these are all available now at about a quarter of the price. As an aside to this, uh, one of A. Waite's later books is called The Quest of the Golden Stairs. It's an awful book, but it looks rather handsome. It's a quarter and it's a kind of <coughs> monstrous fairy tale. And that was published by the Theosophical Publishing House in 1927. It fell into my hands as a remainder, and I bought the whole of the remainder, which was, unfortunately for me, about 75 copies. And that was in about 1981, so it didn't succeed. So if something has been published, you may get glorious reviews. It doesn't mean anyone took any notice of it. That is perhaps not relevant to the periodical press, but it is in terms of occult books. Anyway, I was able to find a set of Lucifer of which the early volumes had been bound up with the wrappers in a small Rosicrucian society. They just bound everything up 
And so I was able to find every single insert, all the adverts, the whole of Redway's literary notes, which is literary circular, which not only lists books and periodicals, but had often unkind comments about them by such wonderful luminaries as Arthur Macken and A.E. Wade. And is extremely useful for identifying things, that, identifying things that have otherwise vanished completely from sight. But anyway, uh, <coughs> that was something that was to my advantage. I had a good eight months of the literary circular, which was valuable. And then it explained to some degree the great row with the Theosophical Society as to how they came to take over the publication themselves and the development of their own press, all of which is something to follow up. But it doesn't so much affect periodicals, except for one to which I shall come in a while. This is just one example of what you can tease out from the periodical literature of occultism, but only when you've identified and accessed it. For mainstream occult and psychic periodicals, those that are on public sale through bookstores or by subscription, the EAPSOP holdings will provide much of what you need for research. But the journals and proceedings of the more recherche occult societies are more difficult to access, unless you know their titles and where they can be found. Most 19th and 20th century quasi-Masonic and Rosicrucian journals, such as the Rosicrucian and Masonic record which I mentioned, and later periodicals recording the transactions of the SRIA, that is the Societas Rosicruciana in Anglia, John Yarker's journal, the Knef, and a very odd thing called the Lamp of Thoth, which was published in Bradford. Now that is sad. Fortunately, there's a set of that, or the one volume of it, in the Library Museum of Freemasonry. There's only one other known copy, and it did exist, because the owner photocopied some of it for me. It was then donated to the library at Keithley, from which it was stolen, and no one's ever recovered it. So the copy they've got down the road is the only one. I'm not saying it's a significant journal, but it's an interesting one. And it gives you an insight into the way of thinking of those people who wanted to go out on their own and say, we've got the truth and you have <coughs> I know every occult society says that, but this was a very strange lot. Nonetheless, these you will not find. One other, <coughs> called the Psychic Mirror, you will find nowhere unless you come to my house and look at it in my library. It doesn't belong to me. I hold it on behalf of a society which hasn't got a home so it's sitting safely and it will eventually go to the library museum but it was done by a man the unfortunate name of John Thomas who was written up in an, um, in an issue of, th of Theosophical History by me and so you can find out more about that by looking at the journal Theosophical History which although it didn't begin until long after our time frame is an extremely important periodical that you should not neglect even though it's now American well, periodicals that deal wholly or in part with the Rosicrucians and with astrology are listed with a fair degree of accuracy and under the heading of periodical publications in the first two volumes of F.L. Gardner's A Catalogue Raisonne of Works on the Occult Sciences. Here I should point out that bibliographies of specialist subjects are very valuable in terms of identifying the periodicals. Now, Gardner was a good bibliographer a bibliographer. He also sold books. He knew how to describe them, and although not all his information is accurate, he provides also, both in the Rosicrucian volume and in the astrological one, lists of the periodicals under the right heading. So you don't have to hunt them up. You go to periodicals and there they are. Two or three pages of them, some of which I've never heard elsewhere or never seen, but at least you know that in theory they exist or did exist. Well, the other thing about his bibliography, his catalogue, it's particularly helpful in that he includes relevant entries on the periodicals from non-esoteric journals, such as the Gentleman's Magazine, Knowledge, which was edited by a man called Richard Proctor, who was an astronomer, but who also was fascinated by things like the Great Pyramid and the Flat Earth ideas and so on. So his articles are worth reading for their own sake, but he also wrote about astrology on occasion. And they also, Gardner also included extracts from notes and queries. That is an extremely important periodical, and it is actually very well indexed. And you will find things by plowing through the index, and you can identify it. And until certainly the time I retired from selling books, 
volumes of notes and queries could be bought for pittance because nobody wanted them. But they are extremely useful. And I strongly recommend that you use them as a research tool. Funnily enough, Gardner omitted, perhaps because he hadn't spotted them, the two letters written by Westcott in his mendacious creation of a history for the uh, Golden Dawn. But they're all there. You can find them. And it is also to be noted that people like Gardner did produce very accurate, very reliable bibliographies, but you can't assume that others also did the same. That's another bit spell it out slowly, the tendency to assume that bibliographers and catalog compilers are invariably accurate and comprehensive. I omitted the third word, which I was going to say, which is and intelligent. I suspect many of them are not. Let us move on. Most of the British spiritualist period journals, there was nothing psychical until 1882 and the first proceedings of the Society for Psychical Research, so you need to look under the word spirit, spiritual, spiritualist, and so on. Most of these journals can be accessed via the Epsom. Light, Medium, and Daybreak, the Spiritual Magazine, and the Spiritualist are all available, either entire or to a significant degree. Unfortunately, not all of the volumes of the Spiritualist are available, and that is a very important one, because it includes the account by Richard Burton verifying the fact that he's being sort of seen <coughs> by Hockley in the mirror. The same, however, cannot be said for theosophical periodicals in terms of the Apsop holdings. Lucifer and the Theosophical Review are available, but only the first and very insubstantial volume of the Vahan, and nothing at all for the transactions of the Scottish Lodge of the Theos Theosophical Society, um, which was given other titles following it, but none of them you will find anywhere on Copac or on QCOP or anywhere. They seem to have vanished from Kent. They exist. So what you have to do is go to theosophical libraries to find them. And you will find the librarians may or may not be aware of them, but they're usually to be found if you look. They have a value in terms of the content, which is always very opinionated, very idiosyncratic, but written by intelligent people. What you don't have are adverts, with the sole exception of adverts for Redway's publications on the wrappers, because after a while he began to publish and distribute it. Well, I said you can't get them. Of course, there is a set in the British Library. And there's supposed to be one in the National Library of Wales, but I'm not at all sure that is actually the case. So let us turn to private collections. That's where else you must go and look for things. So one thing you can do is to cultivate known bibliophiles interested in occult material and known bibliophiles who you think are respectable and reasonably well off, so they haven't nicked the books in the first place, so refuse to let you see them because you know you'll identify them as having been stolen. That's part of my experiences in the past. I won't go into those now. Well then, let's assume we've got to the periodicals. We've gained access to whichever of them we're looking at. How should we read them? What should we be looking for? Unless the subject matter appeals especially to us, which is unlikely for most people, we're unlikely to wish to read many of the articles and papers. They're often very dreary and very dated, unless we want to get inside the mindset of the authors. An example would be of A.E. Waite, especially when he was writing about the tarot and the association between him and Pamela Coleman Smith, which is much more complex than people realize. Of course, I keep that information strict to myself, and I won't share it with any other researcher. <laughs> unless I'm bribed with chocolate. Well, the real value of all these journals lies in the extras, in the editorials, the letters, the reviews, the announcements, and the advertisements. For example, the editorials in the Occult Review will be announced on the contents list as covering A, B, and C. But if you carry right through them and bother to read them, right at the end you often find as many as two pages of odd little snippets of information that are otherwise utterly unrecorded. So do read the editorials. And the Occult Review is probably the most important journal for the, ninth, for the 20th century if you want to investigate occult ideas. Well, the other one to consider is the Vahan. Now, the Vahan 
was essentially an in-house journal of the Theosophical Society in Britain, subtitle being A Vehicle for the Interchange of Theosophical News and Opinions. Issued originally fortnightly in December 1890, it suffered a sea change after eight months, and very soon after Madame Blavatsky died, and it was released from her somewhat suffocating shackles. Then appeared in a larger format, it's the Royal Octavo, with the subtitle reversed to Opinions and News, and with a new editor, G.R.S. Mead in place of W.R. Old, who we all know was the astrologer Sifariel, and also the anonymous contributor to the Occult Review, Scrutator. The anonymity of the questions and answers, that is the opinions, was replaced with initials, and there was a slight toning down of the pervasive hostility to Orthodox Christianity. The Vahan still provided the minute eye of activities within the TS, and this provides the researcher with a very rich mine in which to dig. What is needed for our research is the indexing of all personal names, and you will find very many of them in the pages of the Vahan. And this allows you to identify the less obvious sets of initials. Many of them are stand at a mile, GRSM Mead is obvious, <coughs> um, JWBI is John William Brody Innes, and others you can spot without much trouble, but there are also lots of odd people who you pick up by finding their names when they're listed as being <coughs> members of officers of different branches of the society, or have incurred the wrath of somebody else and they've squabbled, and the squabbles are printed. We also can find, in many cases, especially with local secretaries, their addresses. Now, this you may say, what's the use of that? They're long gone. They can't be still alive after 120 years. No, but what you can do is look at directories of the period, and you can work out the socioeconomic status of that person from where they lived. And this, if you do enough of them, gives you an idea of where the occult public was coming from. Mostly, it is the middle-class homes of people who were enthusiastic and had a reasonable degree of education. I've arrived at that conclusion by having looked at it and seen where they were and who they were. But there's a lot more work still to be done. I've done this in the context of Bristol, where I spent most of my life. But it can be done for every part of the country. And I strongly recommend this as something to be pursued because it gives you a much better idea of what the structure of what you might call the occult community was, and for that matter still is. Well, let's go back to the Vahan. Apart from identifying all these individual names, we need to find out what they were doing. And we have all their disagreements recorded, the great rows in the TS, the battle over William Quan Judge, and so on. These are more important than we think, because so many people wrote about them. And this is, brings out one of the things where I said you can't be sure that the bibliographers have spotted everything. Analyzing the content of the answers to the questions put in, um, and usually by regular contributors, both cases, questions and answers, they'll reveal the reasons for specific individuals, such as Brodinus and me, for taking a particular stance over the various civil wars within the TS, and for their allegiance to particular factions. I won't offer any conclusions on this, because this may be part of your work in the future. But there's also the prospect of less partisan research, in the sense it doesn't impinge on the occult. As an example, is contributions by George Russell, by A.E. Now, Alan Denson's bibliography is very good. He refers to the Vahan, and he identifies that a quotation from a letter, a printed letter, right, I'll just go through this bit, and the rest you'll have to wait till you ask questions. Um, what he did <coughs> was to say, here is an extract from an undiscovered letter, printed letter, of A.E. <coughs> this was quoted by Mead in response to something. What he managed to miss was a question that had appeared in 1892, and it was a complex question, a very wordy one, on the policy of non-resistance to evil. And this appeared under the initials G. W R. Now, I wouldn't say that's the Great Western Railway. Uh, even though, surprisingly, at that time, or just before that time, A. E. Wake was working for the Great Western Railway, <coughs> it is actually George William Russell, an undiscovered contribution to his writing, of little significance. But I'm sure there are many others, other people, 
who wrote, whose identities we haven't yet put online, but whom we can find, and whose place in the great scheme of things can be found. Now, there's nothing else to say of any great note except something about <coughs> a weight, and I'll leave that because I'm getting fed up with weight myself. One other thing, however, one last point, if I've just got time for this, is something I discovered <coughs> by chance in the journal Light. Among weight contributions, a letter when, in the course of this great battle he had with other people over the Leo Taxon affair, you know, the supposed satanic masons in France. <coughs> he refers to Eliphas Levi, and in so doing, quite without any deliberate intent, he indicates part of the content of the very first official history lecture circulated within the Golden Dawn. No copy of this is known to survive, and I don't think it does, but you can pick up what it was like <coughs> from that letter in light. What I shan't do is tell you where exactly to find it, because that would spoil your enjoyment of hunting through that dreadful periodical to yourselves. As I'm come to an end, I had better say thank you, and if you have been, thank you for listening.